Okay, so we're going to talk about visibility. Um, and here we go. So these are those three things, right? To have a visible image, we need a sufficient intensity of signal. We need a, the right amount of X-ray uh, photons in the remnant beam, right? Or said in another way, we need to start with a primary beam that has sufficient intensity and amount of photons to get through the patient and be in the remnant beam to start with. So sufficient intensity of signal, sufficient contrast, no, and also notice that they don't say maximum intensity. Like the, we don't want the most possible amount of signal, right? We don't want the most possible amount of contrast. We want optimum signal, optimum contrast. And that's different, right? Uh, we have to sort of figure out what's optimum for each body part that we're dealing with. So optimum signal intensity, that's a number of photons in the beam given by our mass, MAS. Sufficient contrast, two or more different intensities, right? With adequate contrast between them. Contrast is given by the energy of the beam. We control beam energy with kilovoltage, as well as it's controlled by the densities of the body. So, so physical thickness of the body parts, physical density of the body parts, Right? You can have two body parts that are the same thickness, but different densities. Right? You can have a, a muscle that is the same thickness as a, as a bone, right? but with different densities. So it's thickness of the body, density of the body as well. So contrast is given by those things. Beam energy, as well as part thickness and part density. And then we want minimum noise. Noise here just says obstructing artifacts. So we can start to think of noise as an, as an image artifact. Things that are on the image, information that is there, but as we said, is unusable or useless information. So let's talk a little bit about contrast here. Okay, so um, all three images given here are supposed to be the same brightness, same amount of signal intensity. Okay, the difference between them is the contrast. So image A has too much contrast. The contrast is too high. Okay, if we zoom in on image A, it's hard to differentiate that person's shirt from the background behind them, right? Both the background and the shirt are some shade of white. You can't tell that they're different shades of white because the contrast is very high. There is not a big difference in, in intensity, brightness, from the shirt to the background. Okay? But you can still tell other structures apart, right? You can tell the shadowed area under the bench from the light area where the sun's hitting just in front of the bench, right? So at, the, at these um, extreme ends, right um, you can have high contrast and still have difference differences between adjacent structures if those adjacent structures have big differences in density between them right shadow versus bright ground right image b has lower contrast ah, sorry moving that around too much image b has lower contrast okay so with with image b you can now tell that that shirt has little ruffles on it right? ruffles right on the front right you couldn't really tell that in image a let's put these side by side you can also tell what you couldn't tell before is that she's holding a little little animal a little stuffed animal toy right right under her arm you couldn't see that before that little stuffed animal toy is white some shade of white which is different than the shirt and now you can sort of start to differentiate that. You can see now the shadows of that little thing she's holding, right? You can start to make out that there are um, the beginnings of what you can see as plants under the bench. You can see them behind the bench in the first image, but in the second image, you can start to make out that they extend under the bench as well. With image C, image C has even lower contrast. So you notice as we're adding more shades of gray, and this is a black and white image, right? So it's all shades of gray. Notice as we're adding more shades of gray, we say that there is lower contrast now. Contrast is high when there are very few shades of gray. Big differences between blacks and whites, 
right? Contrast is low when there are many shades of gray, giving us many different densities, right? Many different densities to compare between. And so we, we have added information with image C uh, because of these different densities, because of these added different densities. So that's the idea with contrast. Contrast is, is the ability to tell apart adjacent um, structures based on the difference in signal intensity between those structures, right? One structure is dark, another structure is light. Two structures that are very light, like the black, the white background and the white shirt, can now be differentiated when you add more shades of gray onto this black and white image. So that's what we mean when we say contrast. We'll talk more about that as we go. All right, noise. Noise is, as we said up here, um, unuseful information. The definition here, any undesirable input that interferes with the visibility of the subject of interest. So they give an example for the everyday world. Rain is a form of noise. You're looking off in the distance on a clear day and you can see the mountains, right? In a, on, a, on a day when it's raining, the rain physically gets in the way and blocks the light coming from whatever's in the background. Rain, snow, fog, or smoke are all examples of noise that would get in the way of the useful information of what you are trying to see. Everyone's driven a car when it's raining very hard, right? And it's difficult to see, right? You have to have your wipers going fast, and even then, it's harder. You have to drive slower, right? More distance between the car in front of you. TV monitor example would be the static noise. I always call it the black and white ant fight, right? Where you have just a, that, 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 exactly that, right? Static, static um, image, electronic noise, okay? Given by bad signal and um, bad signal or poor signal from the antenna or the plug that you're using, right? And so what you have is noise getting in the way of signal. On a radiographic image, noise is given by scattered radiation. Model, we haven't talked about model. Model is the opposite of scattered radiation, right? Where scattered radiation adds information to the image receptor, right? More information on the image receptor, more photons hitting the receptor, but they're hitting in weird spots that aren't useful to us. They don't show us anything useful. Model is the lack of information, okay? Think about like um, a day when it's raining. You're out, it's, it's about to rain, right? And the cement, that you're walk, the cement sidewalk you're walking on is dry, okay? It starts to rain, and for the first couple of minutes, the cement sidewalk kind of gets these spots of rain on it, right? But eventually, the cement sidewalk becomes completely saturated with raindrops and turns that darker color, right? When it's completely wet, wet cement, right? The point between dry cement and wet cement, where you have those little spots on the ground, right? The little raindrop spots on the ground, that's equivalent to model on a radiograph, right? Think of the raindrops as the photons hitting the image receptor, and if there's an insufficient amount of them, you can see spaces between the raindrops, spaces between the, where the photons are hitting and the image receptor, right? Where the photons do not hit the receptor. We call that model. It looks like graininess on the image, okay? And uh, it's called quantum model, but we just refer to it as model. Graininess on the image from a lack of signal, right? This comes from using insufficient mass not enough mass for the body part or insufficient kilovoltage, right? Just not enough penetrating power for the beam. So most of the beam gets absorbed in the body and less of it makes it through the body. Uh, noise is also given by projection artifacts, um, image receptor artifacts or unwanted tissues, things that are otherwise getting in the way of our useful information. So yeah, our three factors that govern image visibility, intensity, <clears throat> contrast, and noise. So let's talk about those qualities a little bit more explicitly now. First, um, brightness and density. Okay, brightness and density are uh, opposites of each other. They're two sides of the same coin. Now, there's display brightness, right? There, you can actually turn the brightness up and down on your monitor. You can turn the contrast up and down on your monitor that's independent of the stored information about the image, okay? So when we say brightness and, and density, we're not saying your monitor is brighter or less bright. We're talking about the actual image produced, okay? Independent of the display brightness. 
ideal is to have an optimum level of exposure, which gives us an optimum level of density in which all pixels within the anatomy of interest are displayed as some level of gray. No pixels completely black, no pixels completely white, right? Completely black pixels indicates saturation. Um, so the more, the more um, X-ray photons that strike the image receptor increases the, the darkness of that pixel spot on the screen, okay? You don't necessarily want any, any one spot to be completely black, okay? And white on the image receptor represents a spot on the receptor where the photons were completely absorbed in the patient's body, photoelectric effect, right? Um, and we don't, so we don't want a bunch of spots that are completely whited out. We want to find that happy medium, right? So every body part needs a, a sufficient kilovoltage and a sufficient MAS mass. So yeah, to achieve this, a portion of the x-ray beam must penetrate through the organ being studied. Um, you know, for example, when we do like a chest x-ray, okay, most of you who are in clinical settings have done a chest x-ray, and if you've not, you've probably done a thoracic spine, right? Chest x-ray and thoracic spine includes the heart, but also includes the spine behind the heart, right? You should be able to see the spine through the heart on a chest x-ray. Okay. If you can't, the image would be too bright in that area, not dense enough. Might be helpful. So that's a surgical hip implant, right? Um, complete hip replacement. You see the little cup up here. You see the hip implant here. They're usually made of titanium, right? Titanium is a very dense metal, right? So this area, x-ray beam has to pass through this stuff to get to the image receptor, which is where this film was, right? So there's a body right here, x-ray beam passing through the body, logging information on the image receptor, right? There's black in the background. So when we say something like an optimum level of brightness or density is where there uh, is no blank white areas or no pitch black areas, we mean within the anatomy of interest, okay? We don't mean on the image as a whole, right? So there's going to be completely black spots on the image. That's the background, right? Where your collimated field, you have like a leg here and there's some, your collimated field is rectangular, right? There's going to be some spots that are completely blacked out. That's background, no problem. You may also see some spots that are nearly or completely blacked out, like such as air-filled cavities, right? Like the air-filled trachea, or in this case, the air-filled um, pharynx here, okay, on this lateral cervical spine, okay? This very, very dark spot right there. That's within the anatomy of interest, but is, is shown as, as a black color, right? That you know, prosthesis, surgical hardware, is going to show up as completely white, right? So there are some cases, although we say something like that, there are some cases where completely white, right, given by complete absorption of the x-ray beam, is normal, such as in when there's a prosthesis, right? This, in effect, is like an artifact, okay? It's a useful artifact in this case, so it kind of straddles the line between useful and, and, and noise, right? But that prosthesis absorbs the x-ray beam completely. All, or the vast majority of interactions of the x-ray beam and that titanium hip um, are going to be photoelectric interactions. Right? Most, if not almost all of those interactions are where the x-ray beam is completely absorbed by the titanium uh, metal. Right? This chest x-ray, this has too much density. It is too dark. Okay. Why is it too dark? Well, I can't see the heart, which should be right here in the chest. Okay. It is completely, well, it's over here, sorry, this is actually flipped around. But it still, still shows my point that this is still too dark because I couldn't tell where the heart was, right? The heart should be plainly visible on the, 
on the image. So there's our cardiac silhouette. Overly dense, right? The image is too dense, whereas this area is very bright. Okay, so that's brightness, that's density, right? And they're opposites of each other. Okay, yeah. So would it be correct to say that the, the number of x rays going to the patient, there's too many penetrating the yeah. patient? Yeah, yeah. And not enough. Staying in the, yeah. in the material. Yeah, there are too many are getting through, right? Familiar, so, yeah. so that's because of one of two things, right? Either, so on that chest x ray example, either the KVP was too high, so the penetrating power of the beam was so high that more x rays made it through than we wanted to, right? Or the KVP was fine, but the mass was too high, right? The X-ray beam was sufficiently penetrating, but we just had so many X-rays in the primary beam that they're just all, or, or uh, uh, you know, too many of them passed through the body. And now there's too much signal in the remnant beam, right? Too much signal at the image receptor, and that's actually destructive to information. You notice that I cannot see the lungs on that chest x-ray, where if you've ever seen a chest x-ray, you should be able to see lung markings radiating all the way out to the edge of the lung field, and I can't. I can't even see rib on here, right? Rib is bone, and we've completely penetrated the bone, too, right? So this is overly dense in the area of the chest. That's a good example. This is another example. Um, the book's assuming I don't have x-rays to show you, but I do. So here's the book's example, right? This is an excess of barium in the stomach, okay? This is a, they've done some upper GI study using, a, using barium ingested orally, and it, what it does is it coats the lining of the intestines, and what we can do is, because barium is a, is a metal, it's dense, so it looks like that, like the titanium hip, right? It shows up as a bright white, shade on this image, bright white shade on this image, and, you know, that's the, by, by the way, that's the structure we're trying to look at, right, but in this case, we're showing you that it blocks any other structures around it, right? Too much brightness can be destructive to um, the anatomy of interest. <laughs> so you notice they say here the only information given about that structure is gonna be at the edges of the stomach, right? We're not gonna be able to tell anything about what's happening inside of the, in the inner detail of the stomach, and that's okay, because it's kind of what we're doing with the barium study anyways, right? We're looking at structure, shape and structure, and the movement of the barium through, the, through, those, tish, through those organs. But anyways, can't see in front of the, of the organ. I can't see any tissues in front of the organ. I also can't see any tissues behind that organ, which is the stomach in this case, um, because the barium blocks all of that, right? Too much brightness in those areas. Yeah? This, is, this might be wrong, but so the KVB kind of equals the brightness, and then the mass is the... I would switch it. It? Yeah, so KVP equals contrast. If you had to say they equal one thing, mm -hmm. KVP is more associated with contrast and mass is more associated with brightness. Okay. They both have an effect though, right? Um, mass, well, to be clear, mass really only affects brightness. Mass can make the image darker or lighter. Mass can't necessarily change the contrast. Right. You can make the image darker or lighter, but it still keeps the, ad the adjacent details the same. Right? The adjacent densities are relatively the same still. KVP affects mostly contrast, right? but at extreme ends, extremely high KV can affect brightness. Right? Like this, for example, can be too dark because of extremely high KV. So it, KV can affect brightness right? uh, or density. Right? So KV affects brightness and density and contrast, where mass really only affects uh, brightness and density. Here's another example. These three lateral knee radiographs, right? Two of which I can actually see at least the outline of the bone, right? The third, I can't, I mean, really, I mean, on my computer I can sort of see it, but on here I can hardly see it, right? Um, I can't even see it, right? Whereas in, in, in image C, there is a loss of information because of too much signal, either given by the mass being too high or the KV being too high. Remember, the signal, brightness and density can be controlled by KV or mass, right? This is also, by the way, why we try to like leave KV alone most of the time, right? We try to like set a KV for a given body part, like my elbow gets 60 KV, right? 
Taylor's elbow gets 60 kV, Sergio's elbow also gets 60 kV, but we might each of us have different mass numbers that would be appropriate for our, each of our elbows, right? Um, so yeah, so it's kVp can control brightness too. We try to leave that alone, letting mass be our controlling factor for brightness. Too much signal, too little signal, right? Not insufficient signal at the extreme end of, of underexposure gives us high contrast, right? Too little signal can the extreme ends can give us high contrast. Too bright, too dense, perfect, yeah. right? Or, or at least usable, right? I can see the bone, I can see the, the, the bright white, I know it's kind of grainy, but I can see the bright white cortex of the bone, the outer layers to the bone. Yeah. This image shows you the cortex. You can see the white ish or the lighter cortex given in an adjacent to the darker medulla of the bone the darker medullary cavity here as well bright white outer cortex and it gets sort of darker towards the middle even though it's grainy it's still happening um, that's useful information to the radiologist or the physician that's going to review this image right that information about the different density between the outer layer of the bone and inner inner layers of the bone are not given here right and they're also not given here our goal is to be optimum, not to have too little density, not to have too too much density, right? Brightness and density are opposites, right? So this is too dense, not bright enough. This is too bright, not dense enough. So, so which is which? So the C is um, too high at KVP and then a is the mass, is that correct? So or it can be given by, so let me let me talk about C. So C being too dense could be the mass was fine, but the KVP was too high. Mm -hmm. Or the KVP could have been fine, but the mass was too high. Mm -hmm. So it can be, remember brightness and density, or just density, can be controlled by KVP and mass, okay? Where contrast is really only controlled by KVP. But in, in the case of density, both KV and MAS mass control the control that, that, that image density, right? So C could be KVP is too high, or it could be mass is too high. And it could be a combo, right? Somebody could have used factors for, that's a knee, somebody could have used technical factors for like a lumbar spine, right? 80 KV, 50 mass, right? Where a knee needs like 60 KV, maybe eight or 10 mass, right? So we, maybe they use too much of both. But either way, all we know is that it's too much of one of them. Right? You'd have to be the x-ray tech that shot this image and know what your factors were to know which one you'd need to adjust, right? Is that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I was wondering too, because if you look at C, you would think if the mass was too high, it would be just a, it would be just a plain white, a whited out spot. If the mass was too high, so the mass still, is the one that controls the brightness, right? Mass controls density and bright, density and oh, brightness are the same thing. Okay. Right. Density is just the opposite of brightness. Right. Okay. So like that's bright, that's dense. Okay. Right. So um, so something that is bright is not dense. Something yeah. that is dense is not bright. Right. So they're just the opposite of each other. Okay. So yeah, this can be given by KVP too high or MAS too high. This can be given by KVP too low or MAS too low, or a combination of both, right? Assuming the KVP was fine for all of these, like the KVP, if let's say all of these were shot at 60 KV, okay? Then this would be too low of mass, sufficient mass, mass was too high, right? Um, if KV were just, if we said that's fixed, right? If I said MAS was fixed, all of these were shot at the same MAS, KVP is too low, KVP is sufficient, KVP is too high. Those of the, you who sat with me through lab, you did this. You did MAS experiments, you did KVP experiments, and you looked at the relative densities, the changes that happen when you only change one thing, right? Those of you who have not done that yet, in laboratory, we're going to do that. We're going to take a body part, we're going to fix the KV, say so KVP stays fixed, and we're going to image that body part a few times, raising MAS each time. Then we're going to do it with KV. We're going to keep mass fix and raise KV for each subsequent image. So you'll see this happening in sort of real time. Uh, those of you, the, my, my few that sat with me through the first lab experiment, what was the bigger effect? KVP changes or mass changes to the image? KVP. Yeah, KVP makes the bigger changes, right? 
little changes in KVP make big changes to brightness, right? Mass changes are just direct and proportional. I have to double the mass to double density, right? I don't have to double KVP to double density. I have to increase it by like maybe 15%, right? So bigger changes happen with KVP adjustments than, than happen with mass adjustments, which is why in most cases we try to keep our KVP fixed for a given body part, right? At the end, almost towards the end of this module, I'm gonna give you guys uh, ways that we can keep mass fixed and, and adjust KV, which is actually the better way to do things, but when we learn it to start with, we have to learn about both control things, right? KVP has a bigger effect, so we sort of try to keep that fixed when possible. And you'll see this happening in your x-ray rooms, right? Usually when you have a small patient and then the next patient comes in as a big patient, right? They would both get the same KV. One would just get more mass than the other, the big patient, right? Um, we try to fix KV and have variable mass for different size body parts. Okay. Does anyone have any questions there from what we just said? One more? Okay. Let's keep going. Um, small note on brightness and density. Most radiographic images are displayed as negative images. That is a light image on a dark background. You can, in some cases, reverse, mirror, um, invert. invert, thank you, that's what the word I was looking for, invert, and it can be helpful. But the point about this is, is that even though that image on the right being inverted looks like it might have more information potentially, it actually doesn't. Okay, they both contain the same amount of information. You've just exchanged the black for the white, exchanged sh uh, shades of gray, you flipped them. Okay, so what was dark is now light, what it was light is now dark. No actual added information. However, because our eyes um, might like that in some cases, might like that inverted image in some cases, it can be useful for the radiologists and physicians to be able to invert their images, okay? That image on the right is bright, that image on the, on the left is dense, but they contain the same amount of information, okay? They've just flip-flopped the background and the, foreground, and, the, and the subject of interest. Okay, so that's brightness and density. Remember, brightness and density can be affected by kilovoltage settings and MAS settings. Contrast, a little different. So contrast, the definition is the proportional difference between the brightness of two adjacent details. So when you said, you know, contrast and brightness have something to do with each other, you're right, right? They do have something to do with each other, but in, in to, to be able to talk about contrast, you have to show me two different things adjacent to each other, right? To talk about brightness, if you can just show me one thing, like if I want to talk about brightness, I can just talk about you know, the surgical implant, right? But if I want to talk about the contrast of the surgical implant, that means nothing unless I compare that brightness to the brightness of, let's say, the bone right next to it, right? That's relatively high contrast. Surgical implant next to bone, relatively high contrast, right? But bone next to muscle, relatively lower contrast, right? There's a bigger difference in density between surgical implant and bone than there is between bone and muscle. Yeah. That's why that's why that um, surgical implant stands out so much in that image. So these two these two in principle should have the same brightness or density. They should be equally as bright or dense. But one has high contrast and one has low contrast. And you can see the image on the left, the image on the left is the high contrast one. It really only shows you, you know, like black and white, low, less shades of gray, shorter scale contrast. And there's less information there, right? Adding kilovoltage to the primary beam, raising the KVP will give us more shades of gray, lowering the contrast, right? adding useful information. Again, just to kind of give you an example, right? I can see now the different densities over here. I can see the different densities inside of the, the head of the femur, right? I can see that there's a bright white bony cortex. I can see that there's trabecular markings here. I can make out those different densities, but I can't here, okay? High contrast, low contrast. Mm. By the way, um, male or female? Female. Female, good. 
wide pubic arch. Hmm? Oh. So pubic arch of, of um, less than less than 90 degrees is male. The wider is always a female. Okay. Small side note. Okay. Alrighty. So um, let's give a couple uh, examples that are not radiographed so we can sort of help understand this. Okay. So um, in these two images, you have two, you know, so you have image A on the left and image B on the right. They each show just two densities. Image A has density on one and density on the other. Image B has a square of density and another square of a different density. We're given density by just a number right here. So we're saying image A has one structure of density one and the second structure of density two. Okay. The contrast is given by the difference in density between them. So two divided by one is two. The contrast is two. Okay. Here in image B, one structure, a density of four, adjacent to another structure of a density of two. 4 divided by 2 is 2, so the relative contrast between those structures is 2. These two images have the same contrast. This one on the right is going to be darker because the density numbers are higher. Right? So overall, this image appears darker than image A, but still has the same contrast as image A. Does that make sense? So raise your hand if that doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, good. All right. So that's that's the that is the essence of contrast right there. If you want to learn contrast, that little frame right there should be almost everything you need to have a relative idea about contrast. With contrast, we need just to be able to compare two adjacent structures and tell the relative densities between them. Right. As I said, that surgical implant against the bone is high contrast, where the bone against the muscle is relatively lower contrast. Oh, and a, a, another note that is rel related to what I was saying, and but is useful to just say out loud, contrast should always be measured between tissues within the... Okay, go ahead. Sorry, this one, back to the chart. Yeah, let me go to this one. Yes. Yeah, let's so go back here. D equals 1, so that's density equals 1. Mm -hmm. What are those numbers? Nothing. No, okay. they're, just, they're just numbers. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. They're not saying one of anything, right? They're just okay. saying that one has a density of 1, the other one's got a density of two. That means the one on, with the density of two is twice as dense. That's all. So the numbers don't mean anything here. Yeah. Um, you can use different units like for brightness and stuff like that, but we're not going to worry about that. All we need to know is just there's just a relative difference. Yeah, good. If that was bothering you, don't let that bother you. Good. Thank you for asking that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, my note. Contrast needs to be measured between tissues within the anatomy. You should not compare contrast of some structure against the black background. Everything's going to stand out against the black background unless it is also black, right? So we need to compare contrast uh, within the, the tissue, within the body, okay? Within, between two adjacent structures, not necessarily against the background. I can show you, you know, background is black. Surgical implant is white, so those two things are high contrast, but it's not right to compare them um, when we're talking about the contrast of an image. And at extreme levels of underexposure or overexposure, contrast is destroyed. If you are so underexposed, <clears throat> so like look here, right? This part of the, of the C-spine right in the neck area, right? That, and by the way, it's just going to happen in, cer in cer cervical spine x-rays. That neck area is so underexposed that it's completely white, right? That underexposure has destroyed contrast in that area. I can't tell that there are two, two or more structures under here because of the underexposure in this neck area, right? So that would be an extreme level of underexposure destroying contrast, okay? Over here in the chest x-ray, inside the chest, there's many different densities there, but because this chest has been so overexposed, so darkened, we've destroyed contrast within the chest, and now I can't see ribs and lung markings and nipple markings and heart shadow and any of those things, right? I don't see them now because contrast has been destroyed. The image is overly dense. Okay, and here's the here's the bad part. 
Um, once the image has been, um, well, so let me say a couple things. With underexposure, right, like this, where there's no signal intensity under in the shoulder area, the image is completely white in the area of the shoulder. There, even on an additional image, there is nothing I can do to get that information to show up. Okay, if it's not there to begin with, I can't force the computer to add it in. Okay, it's just not there. Okay, with overexposure, the story is a little bit different. Okay, with overexposures, over darkening, with the computer, I can do things because overexposure means the signal hit the image receptor, but then more and more and more signal kept coming, right? So, to a certain extent, with overexposures, I can use the computer software to artificially remove exposure and lighten the image up. Okay, that's your window width and level, or what you in the x-ray rooms have probably heard of is called windowing. Okay? I can window back the brightness to, so the image is very dense right now, and I can window back to get it to be brighter, okay? Restoring some contrast, but only to a certain extent. Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, if I've overexposed this patient by 300% or more, it's so overexposed that I can't retrieve back that information, okay? But if I'm overexposed, but within kind of that 300% window, I should be able to get back the information. Even if the image comes up being extra dark, I should be able to window back and regain that information. But the information was always there to begin with. That's the point about overexposures is the information was there because you, you put it there, you just put too much, okay? With underexposures, the information was never there to begin with. All those x-rays stayed in this patient's shoulder and didn't pass through the shoulder and they didn't get to the image receptor. So you can't restore information that was never there to begin with. But in certain circumstances, you can restore information that was lost because of overexposure, oversaturation. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and it's different for different computer systems. That's why I said roughly speaking 300% overexposure, which means if you were supposed to use 10 mass and you used 30 mass, you know, three times as much, right? That would be a, regain, you know, a, a potential that you could regain that information. But if I used like, I don't know, 100 mass, right? 10 times as much, right? There's just nothing I can do to gain that information back because the image was so oversaturated to begin with, okay? So there are things that we can do. Now with film, it was actually a little, a little different. Um, that image of that chest could have been as little as 50% overexposed. So maybe we were supposed to use 10 mass and we used 15 mass and the image got so blacked out that we can't regain that information, okay? you are have much tighter ranges of acceptable exposure number exp exposure factors with film than you do with digital imaging digital imaging widens out our possible exposure window which means that we can be I don't mean to say you should, but in principle, we could be less accurate with our technical factor settings and still get usable images. The downside of that is you end up often overexposing patients for a given exam while still getting a usable image. So digital imaging has come with this big downside that it has a wide range of acceptable technical factors, right? And x-ray techs tend to overexpose patients because they know that. They know that they can get away with more and it's easier to overexpose them to overguess how much x-ray beam you should make, right? And still get a usable image. Well, the patient suffers in, that, in those cases. So um, that's not a good thing. That's something we'll talk more about when we get into radiation safety later this year. But um, that's something to keep an eye on. With film imaging, those ranges were much tighter, so you had to set correct technical factors or you had to repeat the image much more commonly. So digital imaging, our repeat rates have gone down, but our exposures for each individual patient exam have gone up. Okay, um, So there's goods and bads to both. All right, let's talk about... Um, contrast a little bit more, okay? Contrast is the difference in density between adjacent structures, right? Gaze, sorry, grayscale <laughs> is uh, the, just the range of different densities throughout the image, okay? Um, so not, sorry, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Please. So last Wednesday we took an x-ray of a gentleman who had prosthetic. When you know they have prosthetic, would you change your yeah, you got to change your technique. What would you do? You got to raise mass. 
we might even have to raise KVP too. We got to raise technical factors. Yeah, because when she took it, um, I think she just raised the mass. I don't even know how much. I'm trying to remember, but the prosthetic was super bright, and it was like. I don't know, it just didn't look... Yeah, so um, look at, looking at this uh, lateral hip x-ray, right, with the big long prosthetic rod in there, um, does that prosthesis add thickness to the body part or density? Density. Density, right? And um, with a more dense structure, you either have to in increase the number of photons in the primary beam or increase the energy of those photons, right? Okay. So you have to either raise KV or raise mass, but you have to raise them quite a bit, right? Yeah. So raising mass from, I don't know, that hip, I would shoot a hip at, I don't know, 80 at, 80 at 20. It's been a minute since I've shot x-rays in the real world. 80 at 20, okay, something like that, right? On a normal person, right? That person may be 80 at 40. Okay, double the mass. So if they're only raising the mass to like 25 or something like yeah. that, it's not going to cut it, right? You have to make mass changes by a lot in order to see a vis visible change in the image. That, but in, in the either way though, that titanium rod is going to absorb X-rays at a much higher rate than any tissues around it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you raise KV, keep in mind raising KV is going to make every structure around there darker. Right, because KVP adds penetration to the beam, right? Yeah. So you're not necessarily trying to penetrate that titanium rod correctly, because you're not going to penetrate that titanium rod. What you need to do is account for the absorption of the X-ray beam within that titanium rod and give extra MAS to the beam so that the surrounding tissues get sufficiently penetrated. That's you know an example of one where what we're shooting that image for is for the placement of that prosthesis, right? So we need to see the bone. I don't so much care about the muscle and soft tissue around it, but I need to see the bone, right? That makes sense because now that I'm thinking about it, she didn't touch the, KV, the KVP, but she did barely go up a little bit on the mat. Yeah. And you could see the rod really well, but you yeah. could barely see the surrounding tissue yeah. and the bone and stuff. And she, she, she did it, and I was like, I wish I could help you, but I'm trying to figure it out. So here, here's a rule, right? Um, not the rule for prosthesis, but a general rule. If you change mass because something like a body part is thick or uh, they have a titanium rod or something like that, mass changes need to be made by a minimum of 30%. It's called the 30% rule, right? right? A change of less than 30% is equal to no change at all, right? So if the, if the factors were 10 or let's say they were 20, which is what I said, you'd have to go to at least 26 to see anything change, right? That's the minimum, though. The recommended amount of change is usually 50%, right? So if it was 20, go to 30, right? Uh, it's usually So minimum is 30% to see a change. We usually change by at least 50%, though. And often, if you shoot an image and then, like, gosh, that is underexposed, right? You need to at least double your mass, right? If it's, if it's underexposed enough for you to go, ah, that's underexposed, I need to reshoot that, you got to at least double it, right? So minimum change is 30% recommended minimum is like 50%, and then actual changes are usually made by a, 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 between 50 and 100%, right? So, especially with repeats and things like that. Did she shoot one and then had to reshoot for, uh... Yeah, because she shot one and then she only, I think she only changed it by like 30%. Yeah. Seen her do it manually and then, uh, I think she only went up, like, she pressed the button like four times and it goes up, what? I don't even know how many notches, but it wasn't enough. It Next time you have something like that, look at what the factors she's setting is or ask her what she's setting and why. And that's another thing to ask these extra texts, why? Hey, why are you doing that, right? What's the reason, you know? Yeah. Don't quite, go ahead. Uh, sometimes they move way too fast. Yeah, they move fast. Stop them. They're moving fast because they're trying to do their exam. They're forgetting that they are teaching during those times, right? They're, they're functioning as a clinical instructor, right? That's what they're categorized as when they're teaching you guys are clinical instructors. They need to act like clinical instructors, not like x-ray techs doing exams. They need to give reasons why. Because if otherwise you're just watching somebody do something, right? You're not going to learn very much. You need to get a reason why. Okay. Yeah. If they don't know why, then that's that's on them, right? And then you come ask me, right? But they should know why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. Um, so they make a change. Hey, why are you doing that? Right. Yeah. Um, make sure, but make sure, because people can get kind of, hey, why are you asking me why? Right. <laughs> um, so make sure that you under they understand that. Hey, I'm just trying to learn, right? I'm not trying to question what you're doing, right? Because sometimes the why can come across as, you know, why are you doing that? Yeah. As like, why are you? Is that you know, like they think that they're doing something wrong, I right? I explain that to her too. I was like, because when I was talking, I know. 
So they're in like go mode. Yeah. So I had to explain to her like, hey, I'm just asking questions. I'm just gonna ask you random questions, not because I'm trying to test you. I just want yeah, to know yeah. for myself. Like, exactly. And when you're doing it, I can put the words together with the image or why you're doing that. She's like, oh, okay. But like the SI joints, and then a lot of we do a lot of chest X-rays. And the techniques would change, you know, the older the patient was or the patient had like a certain, like a certain disease or something. Yeah. She would change it. She would change the technique. And I would ask her, like, well, why, why would you, why did you change that? And at first she was yeah. like, why are you asking? <laughs> like, no. I'm trying to learn, right? So, so, like, so, well, so I want to know. Yeah. So in case I, you know, I know. So that your techniques, I want to know everybody's techniques. Yeah. So that way I can. So, so you can, what works, for me. what works for you. So, yeah, you know, that's the thing. I mean, some of these x-ray techs have been x-ray techs for 30 years longer, right? And they don't remember what it was like to not know the information, right? I've done this for long enough now that where I'm like sort of forgetting what it was like to not know the information. I still kind of remember what it was like to be the student learning, you know, but it all seems so natural now that I'm like, what do you mean why, you know? Yeah. So it, you have to go into, the, as the teacher or instructor, you have to go into those extra steps of here is what I'm doing and then here's why I'm doing what I'm right. doing, right? The student needs to understand not only what to do, but why we're doing what we're doing. That's super important. So ask those, uh, those clinical instructors. They should should be willing to, to help you if they're so super busy right then they won't always be you know yeah. there are times when we're not so super busy and if we got if we're in go mode we got to go that's fine that's valuable information for you to learn right there's sometimes there's go mode right yeah. but then there are other times where we're able to kind of sit down and talk about it or, or explain things during the exam and there's time you know yeah. there's time for that so helpful right should it should be helpful right if you have nothing to compare it to you know no real world like i know joe has had no real world yet some of you haven't had no real world x-ray in the room experience yet right it's hard to compare what we're talking about against what we do right but then once you have that in the x-ray room experience this starts to hopefully click a little bit more yeah so michael uh, one of the things i do with my uh, proctor uh, my yeah i'm working with is you can review the extras that you take, yeah. at least in our program, yeah. and then I go through them and I go, okay, wait a minute, and then I'll ask him after the study yeah. when we've got downtime. That's good. I mean, sometimes we just have a lag, or right. you right. know, 10 minutes, and it's like, I just look through a couple, and then I get a couple questions, and I say, wait a minute, we did this over here, we did this over here. <laughs> the other day, uh, I was walking a patient back to the room, and one of the doctors asked me a question, I was like, oh, oh. He actually knew my name, and snap, I was like, he asked me something about a case, and I was like, okay, let me, let, let's just get Carlos out of here. And, yeah, and, yeah. You know, I know what we did, but I'm not going to tell you because that's legal. So, <laughs> yeah, so let's yeah. Just get, but it was, you know, a couple things. It was like, dude, he, he wants me, he is expecting me to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, that's good. That's good. And yeah, the, um, that's the thing too is, I mean, you are the expert in the use of radiation to make images, right? That's your job. That's what you have to be the expert in. The physicians are the experts in using those images to diagnose and treat disease, right? They don't necessarily know everything that you know. Right? You guys know different things, so that you will, they will learn things from you. Right? They're going to ask you questions that will help them, and they will learn things from you the same way you will learn things from the physicians. Right? You'll learn what they're looking for, and they'll learn things like how you do what they're, how you make what they're looking for. Right? How you can help them get more useful information so they can do the things that they need to do. So yeah, we're both. We're part of a healthcare team, so any physician that thinks that they're doing it all on their own is just plain wrong, right? We're part of a team. We just all have different roles to play, so we're going to learn from each other for sure. You know what was so crazy to Alex? Hmm. When I went, the majority of them carry this book around. Yeah, yeah. So does mine. When Michael started talking, I was going to say that. Um, so thank you for saying that. Yeah, she's been x-raying since, like, what did I say, 1990? Yeah. And she's like, this is still my book. Yeah. Like, she has it with her, and she's like, sometimes I, if I see an exam, I'll... It's okay to go back and look and just right. make sure, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, like, I thought I had it memorized. Well, no, so Michael was saying, you know, after exams, let's debrief, right? right. Um, my recommendation is during and after exams, you should be taking notes the entire time, okay? So my recommendation is have a small notebook that you keep in your pocket, okay? Take notes in that notebook, just general things you're thinking about in the x-ray room. But if it's specific to an exam, you should put the note, those notes in that spot in your positioning book where that exam is found, right? For, you know, geriatric patients adjust KV this much, right? Uh, prosthetic implants adjust MAS this much, right? Oh for that body part, carry those books in your, they're designed to be scrub pocket sized so that they can fit into your scrub pockets. Yeah, go ahead. 
Post-its are great. So yeah, like, so you don't have to like actually scribble up yeah, your book. You move, uh, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I still I have my original positioning book, and I, I got all my original notes in it from when I was a student, right? Those positioning books should stay with you for basically your entire career, potentially, right? You you can carry them in your pockets to you know every day at work, but you can also just keep them in your you know locker or whatever. Get them out when you need them, right? You don't have to remember everything, right? Yeah. You remember most of it. And you see those positioning books, they don't include everything. If you compare the little positioning book to the big textbook of positioning, there's not a one-to-one -one match, right? Those little books include a lot of good, useful stuff, but it's not everything, right? It's only the stuff that somebody who's trained should be able to refer back on, right? You know, what's the CR placement? What's the angle for some exam, right? Book, uh, just so we can look at it. My book? I'll find it somewhere. Yeah, I think it's I think it's here. Uh, it used to be in my office, but I took it out of my I think I took it out of my office. I'll find it. Yeah. 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 But it's just small stuff, right? Um, highlighting a certain thing, right? Um, reminding yourself that you know, example I gave, you know, when there's a surgical implant, you know, add this much mass. When there's a cast on a patient, change by this much, right? Or what is my technical factors? Because the books don't really, the little positioning books don't give great advice on technical factors. It might say, here's a KV, but not, here's all the options for a KV, right? So those little books are great. They should be with you at all times. That's what the x-ray tech with the um, RT tech, he was telling me, like, this book gives us, like, the basic of it, but you have to more or less, like, everybody's body's different. You're going to x-ray, like, we got a six-foot-four mask, and he was getting a chest and a shoulder x-ray, and yeah. it wasn't... It was mass and yeah, but like collimating and everything else was different because he was so long, and yeah. so big that it was a lot. It was you had to know. Had yes. To know. Yeah, so the, that's that's great to have that to refer back on, and you take the note, and then you can have the note for the future, right? You don't have to memorize. There's a lot of memorizing. There's no shortage of things to memorize, right? So anytime you can not have to memorize something, then that's always a good thing. Okay. All right. Let, uh, let's keep going with grayscale. Those are really good question. I think we're we're getting somewhere here. So, okay, we were trying to talk about visibility qualities. We described noise, brightness, and density. We described what contrast is. This is sort of how we just talk about contrast, because contrast is really the difference in density between just two adjacent structures, right? But images include lots of different structures. So when we talk about grayscale, we're referring to the total range of densities from black to white and how many relative shades of gray are present in that image. Words like, or phrases like long grayscale should be paired in your head with high KV and low contrast. So long grayscale is equivalent to saying we used high KV and is also equivalent to saying the image is low contrast. Long grayscale equals low contrast. Short grayscale is the opposite. Short grayscale comes from low KV settings, and short grayscale can also be referred to as high contrast. You might know what it is when you see it, but learning how to memorize that that those those relationships are going to be important because it's not intuitive to think high KV equals low contrast, right? You think you would think in your head high KV might equal high contrast, but until you actually think about it, right? High KV, low contrast, low KVP equals high contrast. We sometimes call it contrast scale. In digital imaging, we're going to talk about things like dynamic range, um, uh, oh my gosh, bit depth, right? These are going to be terms that you're going to hear in digital that are going to be controlling factors for this grayscale. But grayscale is the thing that we're talking about, the total range of densities on a given image. It's ideal to have an optimum intermediate level of grayscale. You know, an image can be too low of contrast, too many shades of gray, that's destructive to information, and it can have too little shades of gray, that's also destructive to information. So this example um, here, this is a step, step wedge. So from top to bottom, um, we have the step wedge. The x-ray beam would penetrate through each step differently, right? And in, in this, we're showing that the first step, the thinnest step, is penetrated, let's say, completely. The second step is penetrated completely. So that would represent one black structure with no difference in contrast between them. This next one, third step up, gets a little bit lighter. 
fourth step up gets lighter, fifth step up gets even lighter, and then at the sixth step, which is not being shown on here, but at the sixth step, there's no exposure. All the x-ray beam at the sixth step on the step wedge was completely absorbed, no exposure down here. And beyond that, there will be no exposure. So you can count one, two, three, four, maybe five shades of gray, short scale of contrast. But with this same step wedge, we have a difference now between the first and second step. Higher Kela voltage would give us that, would give us lower contrast. Okay. Now I'm able to see more shades of gray with higher Kela voltage. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and maybe more, right? Longer scale of contrast would equal more shades of gray present on an image. Longer scale of contrast is given by higher kilovoltage settings. We have an aluminum step wedge here that we can um, demonstrate this with in laboratory. Here's a couple examples of radiographs. So at the top, you'll see some high contrast radiographs. On the left, a hand. Going to the right, a lateral skull, chest x-ray, pelvis, all high contrast. Very few shades of gray. Short scale contrast. So you notice we're using several words to say the same thing, right? We're saying short scale contrast. That's one way to say what these look like. They also have high contrast. Short scale contrast and high contrast mean the same thing. These images below having, I'll leave the top one up so we can at least still see it, the images below having more shades of gray present on the image have a longer scale of contrast. We have software that can change this, that's window width and level, okay, um, which we'll talk about in digital radiography. And um, But before that, the contrast is set before the image gets to the computer, it's set by the by the technical factors that you have, right? Your KVP, your MAS, your part thickness and, and part densities, those are setting the contrast in the remnant beam, the subject contrast in the remnant beam, and then your computer can make further adjustments to those things. This next slide is to show you that um, contrast and brightness are sort of independent, okay? So, um, let's see, A and C are both light images with different contrast. You look at A, short scale or high contrast, and then you look below it at C, same body part, long scale, lower contrast. There are more shades of gray present in C than in A, even though they both have the same relative brightness. Images B and D are both dark, where image B is high contrast and image D is low contrast. There is more information present in image D because of the longer scale of contrast. Good. How are you guys feeling about grayscale so far? High contrast, low contrast, we have long and short grayscale, good. So that this, this, these four, the point is, when grayscale is not corrected, correctly adjusted, changes in brightness don't fix it. Okay. Um, remember, uh, let's refer back to to this. Right. These two have the same contrast, but are different brightnesses. I could take this one and artificially, with the computer, make it as dark as that one. Okay. But that would still, it wouldn't change contrast. So changes in brightness don't affect contrast within like the normal window. Now at extreme ends, yeah, when an image is completely white or completely black, sure, but in the normal range of things, contrast is contrast and brightness is brightness and those two things are separate from each other. All right, grayscale versus fog, okay? Um, so let's look at these. So conventional film radiographs showing the difference between desirable increase in grayscale, A to B, 
which increases visible detail, and scatter, which decreases visibility of details. So this image on the far right, this lateral knee x-ray, is low contrast, but it's low contrast because of fog, okay? This one, image B, is lower contrast than this elbow A. These are two AP elbow images. This one's lower contrast because of added, added grayscale without more scatter, without scatter. Scatter can appear like lowering contrast or lengthening grayscale, where it's really just destructive to image information. So this image has fogging on the image more than this one does, okay? Um, fog destroys detail. Fog, as we said earlier, or, or we might have said earlier, scatter is a form of noise. So we would decrease that with KVP. Yeah, you'd lower KVP or lower, use a grid. Lower KVP. Did I say did I say increase? Sorry, decrease KVP. Yeah, lower lower beam energy, right? Less penetration means less scattering means less less scatter radiation and fog. Yeah, sorry if I said increase, I meant decrease. No, Good. Thank you. You would Thank you. Your, uh, beams on your, if you were in fog, you would lower your beams. Yeah. Yeah. The same way. Yeah, you don't turn your high beams on in the fog, right? Because oh, no. it's more of that light bounces back towards you, right? And it's <laughs> distracting to what you're trying to see, right? You can't see through the fog with high beams on. Good. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, overexposure versus scatter fogging, right? So image A is just overexposed. It has either the, we'll just say image A, the mass was too high, okay? Image B might have had sufficient MAS and sufficient KVP, but too much fogging, okay? Because of this thick, it's like an AP skull. So the skull's very thick. Maybe they didn't use a grid. Okay, uh, we haven't talked much about grids, but the thing you need to know about grids is that they catch scattered radiation and keep it from hitting the image receptor. So um, image B, fog, whereas image A is just overexposed. Okay, overexposure takes away information. Fogging also takes away, and scatter fog also takes away information. Both of these are um, have lost information. A has lost information because of oversaturation, too much MAS. B has lost information because of too much scattered radiation. Okay, um, last couple notes about uh, artifacts for this section. I'll give us a short break and then I'll spend the last uh, roughly hour talking about the next chapter. Um, so artifacts. Artifacts are, are like noise. They are a form of noise, okay? Um, Anything extra on our image that obscures desired information can be considered an artifact. Iodine or barium spilled onto positioning sponges. Those are dense metals that if they, for, we use them in an x-ray room and, um, in the radiography suites in hospitals. And yeah, sometimes they get spilled. And if they get spilled on our radio, a radiographic sponge, which should not show up on x-ray, it sort of soaks into the sponge. And now you've got a really dense spot in the sponge that would now show up on every x-ray you took when you use that sponge. If you've never seen sponges, you will when you get into the x-ray room. I don't have any in here. Most of you have seen them, but they're just a big piece of foam that's used to position the body. And they don't show up on the x-ray beam, which is helpful. Um, removable objects. So you, before you position any patient, you should always make sure we remove any artifacts in the area of interest. The most common artifact are necklaces on chest x-rays. Okay, They just happen, and I've done it, and I kick myself every time I've done it, uh, because they know better, right? We, we know better. We have to we ask patients, and, and it, it's promise you, it's even going to happen when you say, you know, here's this gown. We want you to remove everything from the waist up, including any you know jewelry or necklaces. And then you're going to come back, and they're going to have their gown on, smiling at you, and they're going to walk back to X-ray, and you're going to shoot it, and there's going to be a necklace on. Okay, Do, just always double check, right? Well, actually, it was her bra. So yeah. I asked her if she had any like metal or bra, and she said no. And I shot it, and I saw it. Yeah. So I mean, the rule of thumb: remove the bra, no matter what, no matter if they have a sports bra, whatever. Remove the bra, right? Do you have something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was more like I was watching the the um, the physician do it. Yeah. And like he grabbed the Yeah, yeah. 
looked down upon if we forget to do that invitation? So, you know, we try to avoid it, right? Yeah. Here's something that's important. Um, the artifact is going to get in the way of useful anatomy, right? Which is going to cause you to have to repeat the x-ray. The repeated x-ray has doubled the patient's exposure now because you've repeated it. Um, but we keep track of your repeated x-rays, right? Every quarter, every three months, someone's going to come in and they're going to look through your x-rays and find out which ones have been repeated and they're going to see why they've been repeated. Now, if you're repeating every second chest x-ray because of necklaces, right, we're going to need to talk to you about that, right? So it's not necessarily looked down upon. Everyone makes mistakes, but if you're like, always making the same mistake then we start to go okay there's a problem here we got to deal with that right but I, I make them you know i make mistakes everyone else everyone does um we just want to minimize those mistakes yeah. Yeah. roughly speaking you should repeat about five percent of your x-rays or less okay so the total number if you take 100 x-rays repeat less than five of them five five or less okay um and artifacts are a big cause of repeats on on x-rays you know simple stuff right hairpins um earrings on a lateral cervical spine, right? Uh, you know, the EAM is right up here, and with an earring on, with an earring on, that's going to show up on that x-ray. That's even an earring right there, um, hanging down off, off the earlobe. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, avoid those things, right? Avoid artifacts when possible. Now, sometimes artifacts will be it, it, um, not removable. Dental implants, not removable, right? Surgical implants, not removable. They got an artificial valve in their heart, not removable, right? The wires, that the suture wires holding the, you know, putting the chest back together after open heart surgery, not removable. So there are artifacts that don't come out. There are sometimes artifacts that in principle could be removed, but you're not allowed to, right? Cervical collar on somebody with neck trauma, right? You're not gonna be removing the cervical collar without physician's permission, right? You can ask, by the way, you can say, hey doc, do we need the cervical collar on? I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do any spinal manipulation. Can we take it off for the chest, for the for the cervical spine X-ray? And they might say no, or they might say, yeah, we've already sort of ruled out neck fracture, right? Or we're very low risk for neck fracture. Um, I've had it where I had to take a chest X-ray post surgery on someone who had shoulder surgery, and after shoulder surgery, they put the arm right like like that across the chest, okay? There's an arm with a sling and a sponge and all this stuff holding the patient's arm in place, right? And I'm asked to take a chest x-ray on them, right? Hey doc, um, can we move any of this? No, <laughs> okay? Take the chest x-ray, right? So take the chest x-ray like they want you to in understanding that there's an artifact there. Maybe add, you can annotate your images. Not You can, add, you can annotate directly on images, but you can often add image notes to the file in an image notes section, patient history. And so you might add in, um, you know, arm artifact is not removable per treating physician, per the treating physician, something like that, right? So that the reading radiologist knows we didn't just put someone's arm in the way not thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Often the person that reads the image is not the person that ordered the image or is even involved in necessarily treating the patient, right? They're a radiologist in a dark room in a different part of the hospital, or they're an off-site radiologist who's never gonna see this patient in the real world. They don't know that the artifact can't be removed unless you say something about it. Otherwise they're gonna respond back or they're gonna have their assistants call and be like, hey, what is going on with these x-ray texts? They're leaving this artifact on, blah, blah, blah. Provide some information about why an artifact couldn't be removed if it can't. Um, you know, cervical spine x-rays always ask if dental implants can be removed, right? People don't think about, you know, retainers and stuff. Those come out, right? They can be removed for, for the purposes of doing some exam. Hairpins, dentures, jewelry, objects in pockets, right? You know, my rule of thumb is uh, I'm going to have them take off anything that's got pockets. You know, if I'm taking an x-ray of a pelvis, I'm not letting them wear their sweatpants even, even though they don't have any metal on them potentially. They're going to be put in a gown in my paper exam shorts because I know the paper exam shorts in my gown do not show up on the cassettes because I've done them you know, a thousand times, right? Casts are an example of an of a artifact that's not removable orthopedic devices, snaps on hospital gowns. I cannot stand hospital gowns that have snaps on them, okay? They have them because they can easily be removed in the case of emergencies, right? Usually the snaps run across the top of the shoulder like that, but gowns are very big and can fit different people differently. Those snaps can actually shift down on different sized people, right? So you have to be, consider those things. IV lines, respiratory equipment such as oxygen lines, route that oxygen line up along the shoulder for a chest x-ray use tape to tape it up above the shoulder or if it's like if they're on three liters of oxygen for just you know um therapeutic oxygen treatment they're not on like some high flow o2 
say, hey, doc, we're gonna, this x-ray is going to take three to five minutes. Can we remove the O2 for three to five minutes? Is this patient at huge risk of becoming hypoxic if we take them off of oxygen? If the answer is, you know, yes, I have a huge worry that they're going to become hypoxic and, you know, faint on you or something, then, okay, oxygen stays on. But if the doctor says, yeah, go ahead, take it off for a couple minutes, no big deal, then do that. Just, you know, think critically, right? Can I remove this artifact, right? And then if you're not sure, ask the treating physician. If you can't find the treating physician, that's a different thing, but usually you can find the treating physician and, and ask those questions. Um, artifacts can be in the image processing itself. So scattered radiation is a form of noise image artifact. False images caused by tube movement. So um, we've talked about, a couple of people this morning when we talked about noise mentioned motion, right? But yeah, motion can maybe be a type of noise um, double image, right? That's from patient motion, right? However, um, recall back to our talk about the x-ray tube and the spinning anode, right? The bearings that support that anode can wear out and the anode can actually wiggle. That can cause blur, okay? That's a form of noise. Um, the x-ray tube stand can get old and the detents that hold the x-ray tube in place can kind of make it a little wiggly, okay? And that um, can potentially make the whole tube move during the exposure. We want to look out for those things too. You would tell that by noticing that the images, every image was coming out with the same artifact on it. Every image has a little bit of blur to it. That would be an obvious thing. All types of artifacts are noise. Um, types of artifacts we don't have to deal with anymore. Conventional film artifacts, such as static discharges like this, um, or uh, rollers crinkling or chemical solutions spilling on, on, the, on the images. We don't deal with many of those artifacts anymore. These processing artifacts are kind of gone now um, because of digital, which is really nice. So there are some artifacts that we just don't, have, don't gotta worry about no more. Um, good, that gets us through this section. Let's take like five to 10 minutes, no, no longer than 10 please. And um, let's get